You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 35, The Second Italo-Ethiopian War, Part 2, Resolution. This week, a big thank you goes out to Roberto, Bill, Zachary, Dylan, and Luke, who have chosen to support this podcast on Patreon, where they now get access to special ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released once a month. As the tensions between Italy and Ethiopia escalated during 1935, it became clear that if there would be a unified action from other nations in Europe, Britain would have to take a leading role. There was public support for such action and for support of the League of Nations actions against Italy. This was generally rooted in the belief that the League of Nations and its collective security goals would help to provide peace and to prevent future wars. Among British political leaders, there was more doubt. They generally supported the League, but there were growing concerns that the League could not provide for collective security without resorting to military confrontation. The British government would steer away from open conflict as much as possible during this time, which made their policy choices a bit meandering. They would at times oppose Italy strongly, at least in words, and then at other times they would take conciliatory tones. All the time, they would hope that diplomacy would be brought back into play and that some kind of reasonable solution could be found. The problem with that hope was that by 1935, there were nations, Italy among them, that were not seeking those solutions at all and were in fact actively rejecting them. This meant that as much as British leaders might search for nonviolent solutions, they were constantly pulled closer to war. In retrospect, it seems very unlikely that a war would have started under any circumstances at this stage in history. The British cabinet did not feel that it was in any way sensible, and it was doubtful that the League would have unified behind such an action, with the French constantly urging caution. However, at the time, war seemed like a real possibility, and the threat of a conflict caused a serious evaluation of the status of the British military, It would eventually lead to additional support behind rearmament, which was already underway by early 1936. At the center of these discussions was the status of the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy had been the British Empire's greatest tool for both peace and war for centuries, but by the 1930s, it was in a critical crossroads. Budget cuts and naval arms limitation treaties found the Royal Navy of 1935 at a low ebb, while the strength of rival navies around the world would only increase. If Britain was going to war with Italy, the Royal Navy would be the key. But there was the outstanding question of would it be able to fulfill the role? Regardless of British policy, in Ethiopia the fighting continued until it eventually reached its conclusion in early 1936. We will discuss that end along with the reactions from around the world to both the Italian actions in Ethiopia as well as the open flaunting of league restrictions. Which would further clarify for many, that the League of Nations and its political structures were little cause for concern. During 1935, the events surrounding Ethiopia, which would be referred to as the Mediterranean Crisis by the British government, would continue to grow. As British public opinion and some within the government pushed for Britain to take a leading role against Italy, the possibility of a conflict erupting just grew. However, the demands of such a conflict would cause serious problems for other goals that were being pursued by the British government and military, most importantly, rearmament. By 1935, the British were in the early stages of a rearmament program, aimed at facing threats no earlier than the end of the 1930s. The most likely of these threats was seen as Germany and Japan. 
It was seen as absolutely critical that while these programs were underway, the British government find a way to maintain good relations with other powers, especially the previously mentioned Japan and Germany. When the Mediterranean crisis occurred, those that were involved in rearmament planning strongly urged that any conflict to be avoided at almost any cost. Among military leaders, there was a belief that even if a war with Italy went exceptionally well and resulted in a victory, in the end it would leave the British helpless against future aggression from Germany and Japan. This was due to both monetary and material sacrifices that would have to be made in such a war, but also because all of the long-range rearmament plans would have to be put on hold for the duration, and it was difficult to know if they would resume on the other side. Even if there were many voices that did not want to go to war, war planning would still continue out of an abundance of caution. Critical to any action was the support of France, and especially the French Navy. Conversations between the British and French naval staffs would begin on September 18th and continue for the rest of 1935. They were far more serious in August, when it seemed that war was much closer, or as First Sea Lord Chatfield would say, quote, we were expecting the possibility of hostilities at a moment's notice. What the British found was a French government that was very reluctant to go to war, and a French military that was in a material situation either equal to or worse than the British. Beyond just war planning, these meetings were important if any action was to be taken by the two governments against Italy. Even sanctions would only be possible if the military, and of course the Royal Navy, were ready to enforce it. Or as Chatfield would say on August 16th while in Paris, quote, There should also be emphasis that the enforcement of sanctions could not be undertaken at the moment which was necessarily diplomatically convenient, but only when the services were in a position to back the enforcement, end quote. Because of the central role that the Royal Navy would play in any events in the Mediterranean, it's worth discussing the readiness of the service to perform these duties. It was believed that it would take about two months for the Royal Navy to be ready, with those two months involving mostly reinforcement and supply of ships in the theater. More ships would be sent to the Mediterranean during September 1935, including additional capital ships like the HMS Hood and Renown. However, there were limits to how many ships the Admiralty wanted to send into the area until it was clear that the French were on board and that the war was imminent, just to avoid being the cause of such a conflict. All ships were given full complements of men and full stores of supplies, although to do so meant that training schools and supply depots were essentially emptied. As tensions escalated, there were also discussions about how best to position the Royal Navy resources in the theater. The traditional base of the Royal Navy was at Malta, but it was seriously compromised due to the power of the Italian Air Force. There were also concerns about the defenses available for the two vital areas on either end of the Mediterranean, Gibraltar and the Suez Canal. Therefore, instead of basing the fleet at Malta, the Royal Navy presence in the Mediterranean would be split between Gibraltar and Alexandria. Alexandria was not as nice from a harbor perspective, and it lacked repair facilities, but Malta was seen as simply too dangerous, and so it was the next best option, and the fact that it was in Egypt with the Suez Canal was also pretty handy. Even if the fleet had to be moved, morale was still high, as Admiral Sir Guy Grantham would write, quote, I am quite sure everybody in the fleet felt more than ready to take on the Italian fleet and was confident that the fleet would be successful in any sea operation that took place. Morale was high. Little was then known about the efficiency of anti-aircraft defense. The Italian bombers were based a great distance to the west, and they were not considered much of a menace. End quote. The concerns about Italian air power would be even more critical if a war did begin because the plans for the Royal Navy were to take offensive actions, moving against Italian forces to prevent them from maintaining any control over the central Mediterranean. These actions would almost certainly bring British ships within range of land-based Italian aircraft. The relationship between air power and naval power was not well understood in the mid-1930s. There was a firm recognition that aircraft were a threat, and so naval vessels were equipped with anti-aircraft guns. But there was also the generally held belief that air attacks would not greatly hinder fleet operations. This was considered to be true even when facing the Italian Air Force, which was at this point in time one of the best in the world, at least from an equipment perspective. One word of caution on this topic it's important not to backdate the incredible influence of air power on naval operations that would be seen during the Second World War. During 1935, the number of aircraft involved and the capabilities of those aircraft in terms of payload and, and range and speed were very different than even in 1939. 
By that point, another generation of aircraft and the associated technological improvements would be present, and there would also just be more of them, as many air forces went through large rearmament and expansion programs. However, even based on the threat level present in 1935, the Royal Navy had some problems. The most important of these was a simple shortage of ammunition. The statistic often provided at this point is that the ships of the fleet had less than half an hour of anti-aircraft ammunition if they were firing full tilt. This is of course a bit misleading because anti-aircraft fire was often done in very short bursts, especially at this point in time when the range of the typical armament was quite short. But it also was not a great situation to be in with a possible war on the horizon, and anti-aircraft munitions were not the only type that the British were desperately short of. There were even discussions about talking with the Germans to try and purchase some ammunition, although those efforts did not progress very far. All of these force reallocations and ammunition discussions were completed as quietly as possible, again out of concern that the Royal Navy might be the one to cause some kind of hostile incident with Italy. At the same time, the plan was put in place should a war begin, and it was kind of solidified at this time. The first task was to close off the Mediterranean to Italian shipping, which was relatively easy given the position of Gibraltar and Alexandria. Beyond this, there were problems, because while the Royal Navy had more large capital ships, they were also split with the Italian Navy in between, putting the British forces at risk of being defeated in detail. The Italian Navy had also been fully mobilized on July 1st, which the Royal Navy was not able to do until war was far more likely due to the political ramifications of such a move. This meant that there were no more Royal Navy ships that could be sent without some time for them to be manned, supplied, and sent. The Italian Navy also had the advantage when it came to small ships, including destroyers. This destroyer advantage would just increase in early 1936, when some German submarines were delivered to the Italians. This gave the Italian Navy the ability, should a conflict begin, to interdict British shipping even in areas where they felt safe, like the Red Sea. There were, in fact, Italian submarines in the Red Sea in late 1935, which the British were not aware of, and which would have been a serious and damaging surprise. The greatest advantage for the Royal Navy would always be their allies in the area, though, and in mid-December, the information given to the naval leaders in the Mediterranean was that, quote, it appears that our forces will have to sustain the war for a non-inconsiderable period. France and Greece, however, have promised full use of their ports, and Turkey is willing to cooperate with her limited air force. Now, having both French and Greek ports available was certainly useful, although cooperation from those nations beyond that was a bit unknown, with neither government ready to make definitive promises that might bring them into a war. All of this kind of broke apart in 1936 during the Rhineland Crisis. When British attention was pulled elsewhere and the Royal Navy made it clear that it did not have the forces necessary to continue its role in the Mediterranean and to protect the British home isles from German attack. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. All you need is a few minutes to start your day off with something historic when you listen to the This Day in History podcast. Every day there's a new episode for you to listen and learn about what happened that day way back when. Today could be the day a famous mobster met their end or the first milestone for humans in space. Who knows what history today holds? Find out when you listen and subscribe to This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts. That's This Day in History wherever you get your podcasts.
One of the reasons that the Royal Navy became so important to the overall structure of the crisis was because just five days after the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, the League of Nations released an official statement condemning the action, and then on October 9th, economic sanctions were announced. These sanctions had widespread support from the League and from the nations that were a part of it. However, very few of them were actually in any real position to enforce them. Instead, enforcement would fall primarily on the British and the Royal Navy. While sanctions were announced, there was not a lot of specific information about those sanctions, because the goal was to try and bring Italy to the negotiating table, not to spark a war. This meant that sanctions would be applied gingerly, and also were designed to do little to actually directly hurt the Italian economy. The two most important sanctions that could have been put in place were not. These were an oil embargo and a closure of the Suez Canal to Italian shipping. Italy needed imported oil for its military and economy to function, but the League could not really enforce an embargo because most of the oil that was imported into Italy came from the United States. It was politically impossible for League members to prevent American companies from working with Italy because the United States was not part of the League of Nations, and it was also impossible for members of the United States government that agreed with sanctions to put them in place. There was just too much opposition. A far more feasible option would have been to close the Suez Canal to Italian shipping. The British could have done this by themselves. The Suez Canal was critical for Italian efforts, and it was used to supply both the Italian armies in North and South Ethiopia. It was, of course, possible for Italian shipping to go around Africa, but this would have added a huge distance to what was already a pretty tenuous supply system. The British were hesitant to take this step, though. There were few actions that they could have taken that would have prompted as much international negativity than closing the canal to shipping for a conflict that they were not involved in. Both of these actions would have had an important impact on the war, but they were not put in place simply out of fear that by doing so, war would have become far more likely. These fears were stoked by Mussolini and the Italian government, spreading rumors that the Italian navy was ready to move against the Royal Navy the instant an oil embargo was put in place. Of course, while the British leaders did take some responsibility for meeting Italian aggression, another part was played by France, even if it manifested in a very different way. France was focused first and foremost on Germany, and so many of its actions involving Italy and Britain over the fate of a country in Africa were framed with an eye towards the threat across the Rhine. Therefore, they made it clear quite early that they did not feel compelled into a conflict between Britain and Italy, and they would make that decision if it was necessary at the point in time when a conflict began. They also refused to take any military preparations too far, out of concern that it would damage relations with Italy. While they refused to do those things, they were very active on the diplomatic side. Some kind of non-violent settlement, which would leave Anglo-Italian relations in good standing, was the optimal outcome for the French, and so the French foreign minister, Pierre Lavelle, was very active along with his British counterpart, Sir Samuel Hoare. These two men would eventually have their names associated with the Hoare-Laval plan, which would be announced in mid-December 1935. This plan was agreed upon when Hoare was in Paris in December, and apparently both men found that it was a reasonable option. However, it was essentially a complete betrayal of Ethiopia. It gave the Italians the ability to annex all of the territory that it had occupied in both North and South Ethiopia. It gave them something like a mandate over large areas of the interior of the country with sole economic rights in the region. It also provided them with the Eritrean port of Assab and some territory to its south. Lewis John Smith in Great Britain and the Abyssinian Crisis would describe it like this. Quote, the Hoare-Laval plan was a compromise between Mussolini's earlier demands, which envisioned the Italian annexation of all the non-Emeric regions of Abyssinia, and the Italian mandate over the Central Highlands, and the terms put forward by the Committee of Five. As such, it was viewed as realistic by the two statesmen. In fact, the plan confronted Abyssinia and the League with a defeat which neither could have accepted and hoped to survive. End quote. This was obviously a lot of territory, but the reason that the two statesmen believed that it was the correct deal to try and present to the Italians was because it was likely the only deal that the Italians would agree to. It represented more territory than the Italians had taken up to that point, but was far less than everything, which is what the Italians were projected to be able to conquer. 
At this point, both men felt that it was far past the point where the Italians would agree to anything less. With the benefit of hindsight, this was probably the correct read on the situation. However, when the deal leaked to the British press during December, it was received incredibly poorly. The attacks against Hoar were particularly harsh, both from the public and from Parliament. It very rapidly became apparent that support for such a deal simply did not exist in the Commons, and in fact the situation deteriorated to a point where Hoare would resign on December 19th. There was still the belief that such large compromises with Italy were not necessary or desirable, and so support for the deal fell apart. The downfall of the Hoare Lavelle plan represented one of the last real concrete set of discussions and possibilities for a negotiated settlement. Sanctions would continue as they had before, but without any noticeable effect on the Italian campaigns. On May 5th, 1936, the inevitable happened, and Addis Ababa fell to the Italian army. What followed were three days of sanctioned violence by fascist militias throughout the Ethiopian areas of the capital. 20,000 people or more would be killed, out of a population of, of around 100,000. The Italians would occupy the country until the Second World War. Back in Europe, the League-sponsored sanctions of Italy would be lifted soon after the capital fell, the end of a disappointing series of actions by the League of Nations. It was, in many ways, the end of the League as an effective political unit, after having been confronted by naked aggression from one of its core European members and having mustered no real response. At the very least, it made it clear that the League, for all of its good intentions, was unable to meet a militant nation without members of the League willing to go to war or to go to war together. I quite like this quote from 1938 from Austin Chamberlain, who was at that point Prime Minister of Britain, and obviously this is at a later date, but he would address the same topic. He would say, quote, At the last election, it was still possible to hope that the League might afford collective security. I believed it myself. I do not believe it now. I will say we must not try to delude ourselves, and still more, we must not try to delude small, weak nations into thinking that they will be protected by the League against aggression and acting accordingly, when we know that nothing of the kind can be expected. End quote. This is perhaps a great distillation of the lessons that should have been learned by League members from the events in Ethiopia. When it came to the decline of the League of Nations, it's easy to compare the Italian actions in Ethiopia with the Japanese attacks in Manchuria, which had resulted in Japan leaving the League of Nations earlier in the 1930s. The Manchurian incident had been a serious issue for the League, which had, similarly to Ethiopia, found the League of Nations unable to craft a coherent and effective response. Interestingly, the Japanese leaders saw the two events as quite different. They saw the Italian attacks as Yet another example of a nation trying to throw off the shackles of Anglo-French hegemony, just like the Japanese had tried to do in Asia. However, they saw the actions taken by Italy as quite distinct from their own in Manchuria. Instead of seeking to remove European influence from their area of the world, as the Japanese had done, the Italians were instead trying to spread European influence into an area that was previously free of it. This put the anti-league sentiments in Japan, which had been strong enough to cause them to exit the organization into conflict with the anti-European feelings which were always present. In the end, Japan simply maintained strict neutrality and did not go along with League sanctions. The two countries would later be brought closer together due to their two imperialist actions when they both diplomatically recognized the other's new territories in the late 1930s, the first nations to do so. In Germany, the Ethiopian crisis was seen as very advantageous, as it clearly caused serious rifts in the stress of front which had been formed, and especially between Britain and Italy, two nations that had previously been on good terms which might have united against Germany. In some ways, Germany and Italy both benefited from the actions of the others at this time. Italian actions in Ethiopia caused political rifts, and the remilitarization of the Rhineland hindered the ability of France and Britain to take united actions in regards to Ethiopia. For Italy, the goals of African expansion had been realized in Ethiopia, but the result was less than what was hoped. The cost of the campaign was much higher than expected and left national finances in ruins. Some estimates put the cost of the campaign roughly equivalent to an entire year of Italian national income. This would cause serious problems for Italy as it found itself with a military that needed drastic refitting and would soon need a huge technological boost as other nations in Europe were just then starting massive rearmament programs. 
The lack of ability to invest at this stage would leave the Italian military behind in the arms race that would occur before the beginning of the Second World War, something that they would never recover from. Obviously, the Italian leaders knew that their actions would be costly. Military campaigns cost money. But the hope was that they would be able to extract economic benefits from the new territory through exploitation of Ethiopian resources. For example, like in Libya, they hoped that a massive immigration to the new territory would spark its economy, an event that would never really happen. And by 1941, there were just 3,000 Italian farms in all of Ethiopia. The hope for economic benefits of taking Ethiopia would not really bear fruit as the war would disrupt economic activity starting in 1939. For the Ethiopians, the Italian occupation would be violent and brutal. It is estimated that more than 300,000 Ethiopians were killed during the war and during the Italian occupation, an occupation that would see state-sponsored racism that would continue until the Italian occupiers were forcefully removed in 1941. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we begin our somewhat lengthy series on another event that would bring Europe once again close to war, the Spanish Civil War.